This video is part of an audiobook series featuring Narrative Economics by Robert J. Schiller, How Stories Go Viral and Drive Major Economic Events. For more audiobooks, please visit my YouTube channel or my website for downloads. Chapter 12, The Gold Standard versus Bimetallism. Especially prominent among perennial economic narratives, the gold standard narrative, dating back over a century, remains somewhat active today. For example, President Donald Trump has repeatedly advocated a return to the gold standard in the U.S. In 2017, he said in an interview, quote, We used to have a very, very solid country because it was based on a gold standard. Bring, bringing back the gold standard would be very hard to do. But boy, would it be wonderful. We'd have to have a standard. We'd have a standard on which to base our money, end quote. Stated simply, bringing back a gold standard means defining the nation's currency in terms of a fixed, unchanging amount of gold, or to do the reverse, on demand, so that the currency is perfectly interchangeable with gold. The world solidly abandoned the gold standard in 1971. Since then, countries have used fiat money, that is, money not really backed by anything. Central banks, with the notable exception of the Bank of Canada, still own gold, though gold no longer backs their currency. According to the World Gold Council, central banks and finance ministries around the world own a total of 33,000 metric tons of gold, worth approximately 1.4 trillion U.S. dollars. But gold doesn't back the currency, so why do central banks hold it? U.S. Congressman Ron Paul asked the U.S. Chairman of the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, why the Fed holds gold and not diamonds. Bernanke gave a candid answer, saying, well, it's tradition, a long-term tradition. Bernanke was re apparently referring to narratives and to the idea that central banks are apparently worried about stories that upset the public if a central bank rids itself of its gold holdings. Some people even think that the U.S. is still on the gold standard, or at least have no clarity that it is not. We shall see in this chapter that narratives about gold and money have a peculiar emotional tone, analogous to the emotions we see in cryptocurrency narratives today. There is a mystique about gold and money and innovations, and a mystique about pretentious theories on these topics. This mystique is often difficult to explain. The story of gold and the gold standard is not simple. In fact, in history, the gold standard has long been associated with prolonged deflation and other economic problems. In addition, the narratives about the gold standard have historically been sharply divisive and acrimonious, much like the cryptocurrency narratives in recent years. Let us look first at this long tradition, at the 19th century excitement about gold, and see how it persists today, and how it has recurred in mutated form with the cryptocurrencies. The Crime of 1873 and the Emotional Divide The U.S. effectively went on to the gold standard, attaching the U.S. dollar exclusively to gold with the Coinage Act of 1873, signed by U President Ulysses S. Grant. The Gold Standard Act of 1900 further clarified the standard. Prior to 1873, the U.S. had been under a bimetallic standard, in effect without calling it that, and the Coinage Act of 1834 specified the ratio of silver to gold at 16 to 1. The 1873 move was part of an international standardization of currencies around the gold standard. The 1873 Act was followed in the next two decades by persistent deflation, that is, falling consumer prices. Some observers la labeled the 1873 Coinage Act a crime because the deflation impoverished debtors, especially farmers who bought their farms with a mortgage, by lowering the price at which they could sell their crops and raising the real value of their debts. Also, people who'd made major purchases were dismayed to see that they could have bought them for less if only they'd waited. The talk at that time, notably by farmers, encouraged moral outrage and public support for a return to bimetallism. The bimetallism proposal 
which was discussed internationally in the late 19th century and which gained enormous traction in the U.S., advocated a return to having two metals backing the currency, enabling people who owed money denominated in dollars, in effect, to choose which metal to pay in. Under the gold standard, as defined in the U.S., a contract specifying payment of $1 was a contract to deliver 1 20.67th of an ounce of gold. Under a bimetallic standard with a 16 to 1 ratio, the contract would have been interpreted as an agreement to deliver either this amount of gold or 16 times as much in silver. Advocates of bimetallism became known as silverites, almost as if they were a political party, though in the U.S., in fact, they were allied with the Democratic Party. The Silverites never succeeded in moving the U.S. to bimetallism, but by the 1890s, the Silverites' proposal suddenly gained popularity. However, by the 1890s, the actual market prices of the two metals in world commerce implied a ratio of around 30 to 1. Thus, the bimetallism proposal would have allowed debtors to cut their debts roughly in half by choosing to repay them in silver rather than gold. In effect, the result would have been a default on about half the value of all debts denominated in U.S. dollars. Supporters of the gold standard therefore thought of themselves as upholding truth and honesty. As figure 12.1 shows, the term gold standard has not appeared very often in English language books, newspapers, or magazines, except in two decades, the 1890s and the 1930s. There is also a small uptrend in the use of the term after the year 2000, but with the gold standard usually just meaning the best of any product. Those two decades, the 1890s and the 1930s, were precisely the decades of the two biggest U.S. depressions as measured by the unemployment rate. Because the gold standard was talked about very much during these depressions, we ought to consider how the gold standard narratives relate to the potential for severe depression. In both cases, the 1890s and the 1930s, the talk was of debauching the gold standard, allowing debt to be paid with less gold, and complaining that ending the gold standard meant ending something traditional and honest. People seem to have a natural respect for ideas that they perceive as coming from the wisdom of the past and that reflect true or important values. That's an important phrase. The term devaluation entered the English language in 1914, referring to the decline in the currency's value, and it started to become popular in the 1930s. There was no such word in the 1890s after the first severe depression. However, that decade saw a resurgence of silverite narratives. Their opponents in the 1890s thought that bimetallism was a dishonest attempt to avoid national shame for default. In April of 1895, the Atlanta Constitution reported on the idea of returning to bimetallism at 16 to 1, an idea that had started going viral. Quote, Representative Hepburn is in town, having spent a month or so traveling in Iowa since the adjournment of Congress. He says that he has visited every county in the district and various other sections of the state and has found that everybody is crazy on the silver question. It is the only topic that they will talk about. Whenever two men get together, whether it is at the post office or on a street corner, in the railway station or at the corner grocery, or while riding in cars, they discuss nothing else, and the sentiment is almost unanimous in both parties that the U.S. government should immediately declare in favor of the free and unlimited coinage of silver, regardless of the policy of the European nations. End quote. Belief in bimetallism took on strong geographic and social class dimensions. Eastern intellectuals favored the gold standard, while Westerners, who were more likely to be farmers, favored bimetallism. Supporters of the gold standard tended to, be, tended to appreciate symphony performances, while silver, silverites liked to watch boxing matches. By some accounts, silverites tended to be hypermasculine and war-mongering. In 1897, the New York Times asked, Is there something in the silver creed that brings out the natural savagery of its sectaries, and makes them delight in the barbarous principles and rough ways of early man.
the debate began to take on strong emotional significance. One observer begged the Easterners not to ridicule the Silverites out west. Quote, Some of the Eastern people either misunderstand the character and force of the silver sentiment in the West, or purposely deceive themselves about it. Such epithets as Western lunatics, knaves of the prairies, lazy shifters, mining camp robbers, deadbeats, repudiationists, and anarchists have no other effect than to cause irritation and anger. End quote. The same observer was amazed by the strong differences in ideas, given that most of the Westerners had migrated there from the East. He went on to describe the emotionally charged constellation of ideas that the Western Silverites seemed to share, particularly their resentment of the monetary experts who believed that any change in the U.S. monetary standard would require delicate international negotiation. Ultimately, he underestimated the power of geographically local idea epidemics. The contagion of the bimetallism concept was not confined to the U.S. The International Bimetallism Conference in London in 1894 noted that a long, slow deflation caused by the gold standard had produced depression in agriculture across much of the world. The conference report said that the U.S. suffered more than any other countries, and no other major country saw such a swelling of popular support for bimetallism. The condescending attitude of Eastern intellectuals in the U.S. was surely noted and resented at the height of the bimetallism controversy. We can see how other narratives played on this resentment. Coyne's Financial School by lawyer William Hope Harvey was published in 1894 in the middle of the 1890s Depression. It presented an argument in favor of bimetallism. One wonders how a book on such an arcane and technical issue could have become a bestseller in the U.S. It is widely reputed to have sold a million copies when the U.S. population was only a little over 20% of today's population. But the book is presented in an engaging way, in the form of a, of a fictional dialogue with numerous pictures. The story follows a young man, perhaps in his early teens based on the pictures, named Coyne, a little financier, financier lecturing in favor of bimetallism to an audience of argumentative men, including newspaper reporters. They report Coyne's first lecture in newspapers, and his insolence angers establishment men, professors, and bankers who show up for his second lecture in numbers. A. Professor Laughlin, head of the School of Political Economy in the Chicago University, a real person with fictional lines in the book, tried to embarrass young Coyne by questioning him about the facts of the gold standard, but young Coyne proves that he knows the facts even better than Laughlin does. In Harvey's book, we see one of the key elements in the contagion of the bimetallism narrative, a good story about an intellectual young man who gets the better of snooty intellectuals and professionals. Bimetallism and Bitcoin the enthusiasm for bimetallism in the 19th century seems similar to the excitement for Bitcoin we have seen in recent years. Among my students at Yale, some seem passionate about Bitcoin, and others appear extremely intrigued when I bring it up. Maybe part of the appeal is that understanding Bitcoin requires some effort and talent. There is an air of mystery around Bitcoin, just as there is with conventional money. Few people understand how paper money gets its value and sustains it. As we noted in Chapter 1, there is a detective-like mystery about Bitcoin, aided by the narrative that it was invented by Satoshi Nakamoto, who might be a multi-billionaire as a result of his Bitcoin holdings. However, no one has ever found him or even confirmed his existence. Indeed, the Bitcoin narrative is associated with secret codes, like the codes that are still talked about in popular World War II narratives. The idea that savvy young people understand Bitcoin, but that old fogies never will, appeals to many. It is no coincidence that, a century ago, William Hope Harvey made coin a young man. In the, in the 1890s, the monetary standard offered some of the same mystery that Bitcoin does today. Young people in the 1890s wondered, what exactly is this money we have, and why does it have value? Then they might have asked, 
How can we be on the gold standard when I have almost never seen a gold coin, only paper money, copper pennies, and silver dimes? What would happen if I walked into a bank and tried to demand my gold? Most people in the 1890s never tried to do that, and they might have been rebuffed if they did, because banks satisfied their obligations when they gave depositors paper dollars. So, even in the 1890s, the gold standard was a tantalizing mystery. Silverites and Gold Bugs In many ways, the Silverites of the 1890s anticipated the supporters of Donald Trump in the 2016 U.S. presidential election, both in their sympathies and in the contempt that many intellectuals held for them. A Washington Post reporter visiting Seattle in July of 1896 wrote, quote, The spirit of ardent Americanism pervades the entire population. They believe in a nation, with a big N, nation, and think America is strong enough to whip the rest of the world if need be, and surely to put into force any legislation it may undertake without the consent of cooperation of any other government. They are wide awake, hospitable, and honorable. Sunset Cox, after a trip among them, aptly described the Westerners as the cream of Eastern young enterprise. Thousands of them regularly read the Eastern newspapers from their old homes. For the first time in their lives, they now discover in these same papers that they are called idiots and anarchists. While editor Dana of the New York Sun is exhausting the adjectives of abuse for Western people in general, his own nephew and adopted son, John Dana, is quietly and industriously earning a living on a wheat and stock farm four miles west of Oaksdale this state, and is a free silver man of the populist variety." End quote. The notion that bimetallism is the only route to prosperity became strong among silverites, who suggested that the 1890s depression would go on forever if the gold standard were allowed to stand. This idea was misguided, for the gold standard had been around for decades and depression had not been permanent. But the idea became ego-involving for silverites, a core truth that they discovered that was nonetheless opposed by pretentious Eastern intellectuals. During the presidential election campaign of 1896, William McKinley said that sound money is the route to general prosperity. Quote, Read the history of the great financial depressions and panics of 1817, 25, 37, 41, 57, 73, 1893, and 1896, and see if this is not true. The tr triumph of sound money and protection at the polls in November will, in my judgment, restore confidence and thereby help every species of business. And when that is done, your business will share in the general advancement and profit by the general prosperity. End quote. The implication was that silver rights, typically rural and ignorant farming people, did not read history. But the idea that the Depression would last forever spread among them nonetheless, and the idea worked itself against prosperity, and for it discouraging spending and investing. Meanwhile, those who were fiery in their support of the gold standard became known as gold bugs. Rare in, the 18, in 1874, the term took off on what appears to be a hump-shaped infective curve, peaking in 1896 during the depths of the Great Depression of the 1890s, not the Great Depression. After McKinley defeated William Jennings Bryan in the 1896 presidential election, a joke went viral. A silverite would ask a gold bug, Have you seen the general? The other would invariably respond, General who? The pr answer was general prosperity, referring to McKinley's words during the campaign. The joke faded in 1897, around a year after the election. It's, it lost its effect when the economy began showing signs of improvement. Narratives trigger the 1893 bank runs. The 1893 to 1899 depression in the United States started suddenly, quite suddenly, in the spring of 1893 with a string of bank runs. Depositors rushed to pull their money out of banks, thereby fueling the bank failures that they feared. But what triggered the bank run? One trigger was a rumor that began on April 17th of 1893, 
that the U.S. sub-treasury offices would no longer redeem treasury notes in gold, but would provide only silver, in amounts worth about half as much as the notes. There was no basis for this rumor except the news that treasury reserves were falling. Newspapers had made big news out of the fact that treasury reserves had fallen below $100 million, just because it was a round number. But the run on the commercial banks, not on the treasury, oh, but the run was on commercial banks, not on the treasury. Alexander Dana Noyes, later the financial editor of the New York Times, commented in 1898, quote, Panic is in its nature unreasoning. Therefore, although the financial fright of 1893 arose from fear of depreciation of the legal tenders, government issued money, the first act of frightened bank depositors was to withdraw these very legal tenders from their banks. End quote. Noyes believed that depositors drew their money from commercial banks, which had nothing to do with redeeming legal tenders with gold, because the paper money was the only form of money they were in the habit of using, and because withdrawing from the local bank is what people did in the popular narratives about past times of financial distress. In other words, they were playing by a script that they had seen or heard about many times before. Hmm, people follow scripts. They were used to going to the commercial banks, but not to the sub-treasury offices where they could demand gold in exchange for notes. So, the initial panic of spring 1893 seems to have been the result of the high contagion of stories of bank failures. But this story is not enough to explain the extended depression of 1893 to 1899. In reading accounts of the gold standard in the 1890s, we see an almost religious attachment to the idea among a large fraction of the U.S. population, largely, Easterners, largely Easterners and educated. The support for the gold standard was based on the idea that contracts were written with the gold standard as an assumption. Therefore, monkeying with the gold standard could amount to reneging on a contract. Beyond its business significance, gold has an, an enormous spiritual significance that economists usually do not consider. Wedding rings are made from it. The word gold appears 419 times in the King James Version of the Bible. Paintings of saints depict a gold-colored nimbus radiating from their heads. In Christian society, these saints were often among the lowly and despised in society, but the nimbus reveals their true worth. In his 1860 poem to his readers, titled, To You, Whoever You Are, Walt Whitman wanted to show that he values every one of his readers. Quote, But I paint myriads of heads, but paint no head without its nimbus of gold-colored light. From my hand, from the brain of every man and woman it streams, effulgently flowing forever. End quote. The narrative in favor of the gold standard took on strong principle-based symbolic dimensions. In 1874, amidst the controversy over the Coinage Act, which demonetized silver and put the U.S. squarely back on the gold standard, U.S. Senator John P. Jones of Nevada stated, as recorded in the Congressional Globe, quote, Gold is the articulation of commerce. It is the most potent agent of civilization. It is gold that has lifted the nation from barbarism. It has done more to organize society, to promote industry, and ensure its rewards, to inspire progress, to encourage science and the arts more than gunpowder, steam, or electricity, end quote. In the same debate in 1874, Senator William Morris Stewart, also of Nevada, a gold and silver mining state, said, quote, you may fix up all the propositions you please, but the real thing is, when you come down to it finally, I don't care how much you discuss it or how many resolutions you pass. They don't make any difference. You must come to the same conclusion that other people have, that gold is recognized as the universal standard of value. End quote. These statements, which had political goals, oversimplify history. Indeed, there has not been a gold standard through much of history. The standard model, a single gold coin representing legal tender, subsidiary coinage of base metal, and paper money with value based on the government's unqualified willingness to exchange it for legal tender, first came about during the 18th century in the United Kingdom. In 
The standard model was not fully adopted in the United States until 1879. Talk about the gold standard began in 1874, but it grew in a nice epidemic curve. Cross of Gold The narrative of those opposing the gold standard strongly emphasized unjust inequality. In his 1895 book, The American Plutocracy, Milford Ryerson Howard wrote of America divided into two classes, the plutocracy and the toilers of the nation, saying, The greatest struggle of all the ages is the one now going on between these two classes. He saw the moral value attached to the gold standard as a canard promulgated by a conspiracy of established leaders to justify simple robbery of working people. This is a modern brigand, brig, brigandage upheld by the law and made respectable by society and the plutocratic churches. Hmm. That side of the story was contagious in certain quarters, producing a constellation of stories that fed on that contagion, stories of arrogant and grasping business managers who tricked and manipulated innocent people. But it wasn't the only story. On the other side was a story about the stupid masses swept into a dangerous populist movement, a movement associated at the time with the Democratic Party, but running contrary to the party's traditional values. Henry Davis of the California Optical Company said in 1896, quote, The riffraff is a very large proportion of the voters, and there is danger of their gaining control. Our hope lies in educating them to a greater intelligence to change their views. Their success would destroy confidence, the unrest would be continued, and business would continue to suffer, end quote. A constellation of narratives arose to reinforce the idea that silver rights are stupid and that economic disaster was imminent. Charles Merrill of Hallbrook Merrill and Stetson, a retailer of, of kitchen appliances and plumber supplies, said in 1896, quote, I have made this thing a deep study, since it is a matter which interests all citizens, merchants and working men alike. I believe that if Brian is elected, and the Democratic platform is carried out, it will be the most disastrous thing that could happen to this country. Business is bad enough now, but it would be simply ruined in case of Democratic success, and all classes of people would feel the effect of it equally. If the principles of the Democratic platform were embodied into laws, I might as well go out of business. It would be worse than a civil war." During the late war, we managed to maintain our credit, but we could not do so if the democratic platform were put into effect, end quote. Nonetheless, the Democrats understood the power of gold and used it in their narratives. William Jennings Bryan's Cross of Gold speech at the July 1896 Democratic National Convention is considered one of the most inspiring American political speeches of all time. It interwove talk of the gold standard with talk of Christian morality. Even today, millions of people remember the concluding lines of the speech. Quote, Having behind us the commercial interests and the laboring interests of all the toiling masses, we shall answer their demands for a gold standard by saying to them, You shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. End quote. As Brian spoke these words, he stretched his arms out as if he were on a cross to a cheering crowd. The reaction was immediate, not only on the convention floor, but also nationwide, sometimes to the point of near hysteria, as if a revolution were at hand and the working class would finally prevail. Why are Brian's concluding lines so powerful? Likely, the working classes connected their economic suffering with the imagery of Jesus' suffering, a brutal execution at the hands of the powerful Romans, one of the narratives that helped propel the Christian church through the centuries. Although Brian spoke the words, he did not write the lines. As many newspapers later reported, a talk by U.S. Representative Samuel McCall in January of 1896 and reprinted in the congressional record, used almost the same words about a crown of thorns and a cross of gold. Brian had attended McCall's talk, and he'd gauged the audience's reaction to those lines. He was doing what great demagogues have always done, observing the audience 
experimenting and searching for something that will take. As the New York Times commented, quote, Full many a gem of purest ray serene the dark unfathomed files of the congressional record may bear. Holy crap. But until the gem has been mined, or rather, until the vein has been worked by the patient toilers among the back numbers and then issued with an authoritative stamp, it remains useless to man, end quote. The authoritative stamp that Brian, a celebrity, put on McCall's ruminations was exactly what this story needed to go viral. McCall's words were not a story until a presidential candidate said them in a public forum. The effects of these conflicting narratives was to leave people unusually uncertain about the value of money and business activity in the near future. Louis Sloss of the Alaska Commercial Company was one of many businessmen who described in 1896 their unwillingness to sign contracts or commit resources at a time when they feared a major devaluation of the money supply and abrogation of contracts. Quote, Business is very dull, almost at a standstill. Capital is timid and confidence is shaken. Nobody wants to invest in any enterprise, no matter how alluring the proposition, until this scare of unsound money is over. I know of an instance which illustrates to what extent business suffers from this unrest and agitation and the uncertainty of our financial basis. One of my relatives and a member of this firm contemplated erecting two magnificent houses to cost at least $50,000. The plans were drawn, the bids had been submitted, and all was ready, except the signing of the contracts. The prospective builder refused to sign or undertake the building until after the election, when the financial question of the country will be settled. There are undoubtedly many similar instances, and they are the things that stagnate the course of trade. End quote. Among economists and other intellectuals, it was widely thought that moving to a bimetallic standard might double the price level, because the market price of gold meant the ratio should have been 30 to 1. According to classical economics and Gresham's Law, which says that bad money drives out good, silver would drive out gold, putting the U.S. onto a de facto silver standard. To return to the houses that Sloss wrote about, Bimetallism would mean, in effect, that each $50,000 house would sell for $100,000. With that expected price, the buyer would be eager to sign at $50,000, while the builder would eventually want $100,000 in compensation. But expectations were muddy, because the politics of bimetallism were uncertain and unprecedented. It is easy to see how the buyer and the builder might find it difficult to come to an agreement. An 1893 article from the Chicago Daily Tribune illustrates how dramatic bimetallism's effects might be. Quote, if we continue the purchase of silver or make the coinage free at the ratio of 16 to 1 or 20 to 1, we shall practically demonetize gold and drive it out of the country and sink to a silver basis. This would mean to every wage worker the loss of nearly one half the purchasing power of his wages to every bank depositor, the loss of nearly one-half the value of his deposit. Free coinage of silver in this country would be the most gigantic fraud and robbery ever perpetrated on a people. End quote. How, then, is it possible that William Jennings Bryan came close to being elected president of the U.S. and committing that fraud and robbery? Brian's popularity came from a sequence of popular narratives about bimetallism that went viral because they seemed to justify, at least to some voters, that bimetallism was legitimate, or more precisely, that bimetallism at a 16 to 1 or 20 to 1 ratio with gold was legitimate. We mustn't assume that the typical American had a deep or even any understanding of the monetary system. In the 1890s, most people in the U.S. were fundamentally confused about bimetallism and the existing monometallic, or gold, standard. The confusion came because there were both gold and silver coins in circulation that were freely accepted as an equivalent value, even though the gold content of a gold coin was worth in the metals market about twice the market value of a silver dollar. Also, there were paper dollars, silver, the silver certificates, 
that had inscribed on them one silver dollar and payable to the bearer on demand. Isn't that a silver standard? In fact, however, if one brought 100 silver dollars or $100 worth of silver certificates to the U.S. Sub-Treasury Office, then they would freely give 100 gold dollar coins in exchange. They would do this since failing to do so would disrupt the free convertibility of the gold and silver dollars. The key point is that many people did not understand that the U.S. Treasury would not give gold dollars in exchange for metallic silver. If they did that, then the U.S. Treasury would see a vast amount of silver presented for conversion in gold. Anyone could have done this repeatedly. Buy metallic silver on the market, exchange it for gold at the sub-treasury, using the gold to buy more silver on the metals market, and repeat the process every day, which would eventually allow one to amass a huge fortune. But the supply of U.S. silver dollars was limited by the U.S. government. Practically, no one paid any attention then to the type of currency they received or spent. In fact, most people didn't even know how to convert their cash into gold if they wanted to. Why then did narratives of unsound money circulate so strongly? Why did the call for a bimetallic standard become so vehement in the last decade of the 19th century? One reason is obvious. The idea was promoted that debtors would see their burden cut in half if they could pay in silver at 16 to 1. The idea must have seemed like a form of salvation to them, and any story suggesting the possibility of such a change would certainly be appealing. Recall, too, that the bimetallism narrative was often framed as revenge for the crime of 1873, through which an act of Congress ended the bimetallic standard. Put these together, bimetallism was a proposal to make a seemingly subtle and clever change in the backing of the currency that most uninformed people wouldn't even grasp, like the, crypto, like the cryptography behind Bitcoin that very few understand today. So, bimetallism was a cool idea, or a capital idea, as they would say in the 1890s. On top of that, bimetallism might compensate for perceived injustice, the source of much anger. The two together gave bimetallism intense contagion. The Yellow Brick Road The peculiar contagion of gold and silver narratives is exemplified by the appearance of a social epidemic surrounding a children's book by then-obscure author L. Frank Baum. The Wonderful Wizard of Oz was published in May of 1900, at the start of the second presidential election campaign between McKinley and Bryan, when bimetallism was again a key issue. The book is a children's story about a young girl named Dorothy, who, with her little dog Toto, is transported to the mysterious land of Oz. The story is a sort of odyssey, as Dorothy, wearing magical silver slippers and pursued by a witch, follows a yellow brick road to meet the Wizard of Oz. Accompanying her are Toto and three newfound friends. In the end, the Wizard of Oz is shown to be a weak little man who is a phony. Some people read the book as a parable. The yellow brick road is the gold standard. The silver slippers are the free silver movement. The Wizard of Oz is President McKinley, and the Cowardly Lion companion is William Jennings Bryan. Oz itself is an abbreviation for ounce, the usual unit of measurement for gold or silver. The book did not garner critical acclaim, but it was a bestseller and became contagious. By 1902, it was a musical extravaganza on stage. Its success went meteoric with the release of the movie The Wizard of Oz, starring Judy Garland in 1939. Although the film changed the ruby slippers, sorry, the silver slippers into ruby slippers to take full advantage of the relatively new color film. Interest was renewed again in 1972 with an animated Journey Back to Oz with the voice of Garland's daughter, Liza Minnelli. The best-selling 1995 novel, Wicked, The Life and Times of the Wicked Witch of the West by Gregory Maguire, led to a Broadway musical. Wicked, the untold story of the Witches of Oz, which has been uh, continuously running on Broadway since 2003, as of 2018, the sixth longest-running Broadway musical ever. 
There are other examples too, including a 2013 movie Oz: The Great and Powerful, and a future Oz TV series under development by the 2000 in 2019 by Legendary Entertainment. The success of the Oz constellation might be a vestige, barely recognizable, of a gold-silver narrative that went viral over a century ago. The end of the gold standard. The Bryan proposal to lower the precious metal value of the U.S. dollar was an extremely emotional issue in the 1890s. It was so because of a narrative that economic historians Barry Eichengreen and Peter Temin call the mentality of the gold standard. And the rhetoric of morality and rectitude that the gold standard represented. By the 1930s, with the help of John Maynard Keynes, the narrative had changed, owing to the sense that unemployment was at catastrophic levels. An article by Mark Sullivan in the Hartford Current in November of 19, 1933, around the time of the devaluation of the U.S. dollar, from one twenty point six seventh ounce of gold. To one thirty-fifth of an ounce of gold, and the suspension of suspension of convertibility, explained how the new narrative about the gold standard in the nineteen thirties differed from that of earlier years. The difference was partly a matter of new words. Sullivan quotes Talleyrand, Napoleon's chief diplomat, that the business of statesmanship is to invent new terms for institutions, which under their old names have become odious to the public. The supporters of the devaluation apparently understood this. By the 1930s, the new word devaluation had massively replaced the negative-sounding debasement and inflation. Devaluation refers to a constructive action of enlightened governments, while debasement and inflation connote a moral failing. Other countries had already suspended convertibility of currency. To gold coin before the U.S. did so, in a series of steps in 1993 and 1934, on the advice of eminent economists such as Keynes, the United Kingdom had suspended the gold standard in 1931. The final end of the gold standard occurred in 1971 in the U.S. under President Richard Nixon, with a switch to the floating dollar. The public accepted the end of the gold standard, and economic dislocations were few. The gold standard narrative is certainly not prominent today. President Trump tested the waters by advocating for it, but but the public reaction was largely neutral. However, the fascination with narratives about money certainly lives on, as our running Bitcoin example illustrates. It seems likely that the future will bring new mutations of the money narratives, which will arouse a segment of the public and which will affect future economic developments. In these first three chapters describing perennial narratives, we have seen how narratives can affect confidence in others' confidence, the desire to engage in conspicuous consumption, and beliefs about monetary institutions. In the next two chapters, we consider recurring narratives about the advance of dramatic new technologies that had the potential to make human skills obsolete. And that forced people to think about fundamentally changing standards of living and working. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, and visit my channel for more exciting content.